There are COVID safe practices we need to be maintaining, and one of them is to sign in and try and keep our distance. There is a mask if you need them and uh, hand sanitizer. The hotels provide a drink, but you're very uh, comfortable to go and get a, a drink. We're not generating any income at all at present, but Terry's seized the moment, <laughs> and uh, he's going to come and uh, see if, if anyone's willing to not that anyone's got cash anymore. We've almost all become paperless. But, uh, anyhow, see how you go, yeah. Sarah. Is this thing working? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, look, we're going to come round in a minute with, with, a, with a bucket for two reasons. The book, and it's hot off the press. Now, you don't pay for the ticket. We just give you that. That's free of charge. We scheme you in other ways, but the, the ticket free. But the book is called With Your Latte by Charles Ringmar. Thank you very much. Yeah. Big, thick, theological stuff. This one is not <laughs> that way inclined. But in actual fact, it's very, very thin, as you can see. There's only a few lines on each page. Uh, he, he, you're going to chop down an awful lot of trees to get a decent read, let me tell you. Now, this is very, very unusual. Charles has taken the liberty. This is very, very unusual. Charles has taken the liberty giving a short, pithy statement of inspiration. So let, let, me give, let me give you an example. And on that, you write your own comments, your own reflections, a drawing, a picture, a doodle, whatever you want. So the idea is that you get inspired by the catalyst. So, so Max is going to come round and give you a lucky ticket. Campbell, are you there? Yes, he's there. Campbell, have you got some tickets? Mac, hello. Wake and go. And then I'm going to come round. Max going to give you a ticket. And I'm going to come round and I want you to fill this bucket up with, with crispy notes. Another new book. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. So for those that don't understand what we're on about regarding the bucket, chuck some coins and some notes in here. We do have some expense our speaker uh, with a nice gift. So uh, be as generous as you can. Uh, nothing comes out of this for any other reason, only that you're going to bless Steph even before you start. Okay, thank you, Steph. <clears throat> Good afternoon. It's um, lovely to see so many beautiful faces here this afternoon. Um, and I'm going to say a quick hello to my friend Wendy, who I think is tuning in from Germany today as well. Hi, Wendy. Oh, dear. Um, I had a couple of caveats to start, but then I realised that there's a third and more important one, um, and that is um, I have been the recipient of I have been the recipient of much wisdom and dialogue and journeying um, with a wonderful group of people, um, the leader of whom, of whom was Charles Ringmar, who I don't think is here, here with us today, um, but really. Um, you know, the wonderful thing about the folks gathered here and especially those who are the organisers is that they welcome everyone to be a theologian. Um, and I sat around a, a theological reading circle for quite a number of years before I had my children um, and I was sometimes there with my younger sister and we were by far the youngest and the most inexperienced and the most lacking in knowledge. But we were always invited to share what was going on for us and what we could see and hear in the book we were reading at the time. And that is a very, very precious gift. And I give thanks for that today and bless those people. Um, I've got two other caveats um, as I begin. Um, the first one is that um, I am a mother, as I said, of a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. I also work full-time and have a husband and a house. And so this talk today is far from perfect but it is me sharing my heart, so I hope that um, it will resonate somewhere with you. Um, the third one is that I am a woman of tears. <laughs> um, and um, I remember um, quite a long time ago now, about 15 years ago when I was at Regent Theological College, 
um, absolutely weeping in a um, in a lecture. And I remember the friend sitting next to me being most uncomfortable because he didn't know what to do to comfort me. But I said, actually, it's okay. I'm okay. We're okay. So if you're okay with me today, there may be a little tear or two. How often have you had the privilege of a spiritual friend? Or let me ask another question. How often have you spent time with someone who you felt, as you shared, that you were living the same reality, that you knew the same God, that your life resonated with the life of another? Such moments of deep connection are life-giving. They bring love and joy and hope. A genius born of anguish, so said Ron Rollheiser about the late Henry Nowen. Born in 1932, Henry died in 1996. I have, for the last 20 or so years, read and returned to his writings. I don't remember how or when I first discovered his work, but I do remember in about 2002 telling my high school students that Henry was my friend. I had devoured Life of the Beloved, Out of Solitude, The Return of the Prodigal, and behold the beauty of the Lord. And I felt that Henry's works had been written just for me. And that writing so vulnerably, I had come to know the real Henry, charismatic, energetic, fraught, and tender. This gentle companion of Jesus became for me a fellow journeyer and a guide. Miroslav Volf says, the object of hope is a new thing coming from God. In this vein, I hope my friend Henry and I can one day chat. I wrestled with how to structure this talk this afternoon. Um, but what I want to share with you and what I've come to see as I've reflected, written and tried to organise my thoughts, that as Henry said, the journey from teaching about love, or in my case, learning about love, to allowing myself to be loved was much longer than I realised. And the key messages of Henry's works to me sometimes have been words of solace and reassurance, at others an invitation to live more fully into the love of God. But they are always words I need to hear. Peter Janetsky, another companion on the way, once told me when I said I seemed to be going nowhere that maybe life is a little like a spiral journey we continue to visit near the same struggles, but the depth of the pain and struggle becomes less and less, but it's a reassuring image for me. The life and writings of Henry Nouwen inform and describe a vision of life which for me has and continues to be life-affirming, life-giving and visionary in its invitations. Henry's work has both shaped my journey and draws together themes which are the lens for how I see the arc of my story God's story and where I hope and pray my story continues. What is God like? What is the nature of the spiritual life or how does God come to me and who am I? These are the three big questions to which Henry's words have helped me wrestle with and in so doing Henry has spoken words of life and love and hope to me. It's important also to recognise that people in the Christian communities of which I've been a part, as well as my family, have embodied these words and in so doing have made them truer for me. These questions about God and identity are lifelong questions, but they spring for me from the experience of my life. I wrote in my bio that my life has been characterised by beauty, suffering, and grace. Here is my story as it relates to what you will see are Henry's words for me and I hope for you too. Everyone has a story. But it's hard to tell your story when it involves others who are precious to you and when part of that story involves deep wounds. So I've thought 
long and hard about how to put into words this beginning part of my journey. It is important for me, therefore, to acknowledge that my parents who are here today also have their stories. And I'm hugely grateful to say that they are a very important and precious part of my life, my husband's life and my children's lives. I would like to honour my parents today for their deeply held desire and efforts to make their home and the lives of their children and now their grandchildren directed by and towards faith in God, who is most fully revealed in Jesus Christ. Mum and Dad say their own experience growing up in Catholic families neg negatively impacted their spiritual journeys. And it was in their 20s that God really found them. Their experiences were transformational for them. And from there, they made wholehearted choices to pursue lives radically committed to this God who had brought them, sorry, brought new life to them as individuals and as a couple. I'm 45. And the journey I want to tell you about today begins about 40 years ago. My first real memories begin when I was five, and so did my journey with Jesus. And as it turns out, a journey with my friend Henry too. It's the guitar music, the singing, and the storytelling of, of my first grade teacher that I most remember as the genesis of my affection for the suffering God. Quite overcome it with emotion at the pain of the innocent Jesus in the Easter story, I needed to respond, and so I did with all my five-year-old heart. I have very strong memories of knowing and experiencing as a five-year-old that God's story, Jesus' story, included me in it. I was with God, and God was with me. I spent my childhood going to church two or three times a week. I vividly remember heading off to church on a Saturday night, just Dad and me. I was certain I was a child of God who could both hear and speak God's story. And this confidence had been nurtured by my parents and by the Christian community we belonged to. A church birthed amidst the Pentecostal movement of the 70s, I confidently spoke out and sang publicly the words I believed God was giving me. I credit my strong scripture of knowledge today to my parents and the community into the amount of time we spent reading, speaking and listening to others speak about the Bible. It was certainly a very word-based culture. One church, sorry, our church believed in the capacity of every member to receive and speak God's words. And long before the word intergenerational was a thing, relationships were nurtured between people of all ages. I belonged. The second eldest of my five, of five girls, my older sister and Celeste and I were taught and expected from a very young age to be responsible, capable and helpful. I'm just going to stop there for a minute. The way I've decided to, to share this talk today is to tell you my story first because I don't think you'll understand what I have to say about Henry unless you know my story. I was the kind of kid who rose to this challenge and flourished under the positive affirmation and sense of achievement I experienced as I became proficient. Proficient at cooking, proficient at cleaning, proficient at ironing, and of course braiding the hair of my younger sisters. Though I just asked my sister Ali, I resented the job and pulled her hair as tight as I could, hoping she would not continue to make this request of me. I love school. And it too was proficient, calm sailing. As I look back on the first decade of remembered life, I see Henry's early life where the calling, the assurance of belonging and the wholehearted following was clearly evident. Henry said he knew he wanted to be a priest when he was six. It was a bit like that for me too. I was from a young age planning to be a missionary my year nine high school friend and I determined that we would go to India together. But rough seas were ahead. From where I sit today, I see very strong traits of an Enneagram One in my 16-year-old self. To quote a business website, Enneagram Ones, who are among the most value-driven of the nine types, emphasise these 
three important values, improvement, honesty, and responsibility. And this, ones are conscientious and ethical with a strong sense of right and wrong, always striving to improve things, but afraid of making a mistake. They try to maintain high standards, but they can slip into being critical and perfectionistic. They fear being corrupt or evil. They desire with all their hearts to be good, to have integrity. It makes total sense to me then that things began to unravel as they did. Naturally curious and attentive to truth and justice, I began to experience life at church as narrow and fixed in its understanding and expression of the Christian life. A typical teenager, I wanted to understand how things worked. I had questions, lots of them. Friendships at school became important to me, as had the quest to determine who loved me for me and where did I belong. Increasingly, church became a place where I felt misunderstood, judged, rejected. I understood the culture of the church to be, to be fixed, not open to changing perspectives and new information. I knew my thinking and expression of faith in Christ was changing. I started to hide my thoughts and questions because it always felt like there was no real dialogue or approval for holding a different opinion. I was always wrong. But as an Enneagram one who needs to be good and have integrity, Pretending was anathema to me. I began to be deeply stressed, anxious. And exhausted, wondering how on earth I could manage who I was and the clash I was experiencing with the community of my childhood. Every weekend, the nervous sickness in the pit of my stomach threatened to overwhelm me. I knew the changes in me that others saw were not movements away from Jesus, but I couldn't seem to communicate that or be really seen and heard. I didn't feel anyone could or would really make space to love me just as I was, affirm that despite my resistance to accepted ways, Jesus was just as close to me as ever. And that was what I desperately needed and wanted. I wanted to be validated as I was the questions and pushback included. Two weeks before I turned 17, I left home. As I write this, I feel deep sadness about the suffering of this period for my whole family. It was horrific. I am also utterly grateful for the restoration and grace that we've experienced in the intervening period. Thank you, God. Thank you, Mum, Dad, Cell, Ali, Nels and Jude. But back in 1992, however, things were not going to get happy for quite some time. There was almost a decade of lost years with my family and during that time there was love and grace. There was Jesus and there was also pain and suffering. I was, after all, the prodigal. The family of a school friend took me in and at the end of year 12 offered to send me to Christian Heritage College to study teaching. I had lost any sense of direction at this point and so I agreed. I had loved school and in particular English, so I found myself studying to become a teacher of English and geography. I continued to actively wrestle with aspects of my childhood faith that I had rejected but I was absolutely committed to God as the source of all life, of my life. The deeper wrestle, however, was whether I was lovable. Did I belong? Among other unhealthy coping mechanisms, at some point I'd learned to sate my anxiety with food. Adrift from family and now the safety of high school, I was struggling. I looked in the mirror to see a girl who was bloated with loneliness, rejection and fear. Then 
Then I met David at church, characterised by joy. David and his twin brother Peter loved to laugh. With a faith he wore on his sleeve, David's friend called him the preacher. He liked me just as I was and his family welcomed me generously, excited and happy to be together. We decided to marry. What I haven't said is that David, his twin brother and his older sister all had the genetic disorder cystic fibrosis. And at the time, the life expectancy was about 30. When we married, David worked full time and had been, re and had been reasonably well. But within a year, he was, his hospital admissions had increased so significantly that he had to give up his job. It was hard going, but we were surviving. When I look back, 1998 was a significant year in this second decade of my life. We lived next door to David's parents and his sister. She suffered a lot with CF. One day she picked up a virus and three weeks later, at 27, she was gone. I don't think knowing someone has a short life expectancy makes losing them any easier. It was excruciating for David's family. I'm not certain, but I think this was a turning point for David. At the time, I was just finishing off the last couple of subjects of my BA, B. Ed. I had a teacher who just returned from Regent Theological College in Vancouver. I still remember vividly a discussion we had about our capacity or not for doing good. Were we Pelagian or Augustinian? This has come to be an important discussion for me, but at the time I was struck by this young, vibrant teacher who was filled with stories about this amazing place he had been to to study theology, live in community, and I secretly wondered to myself if maybe I would one day go to Regent. Amidst final study and the confronting sadness of Tonya's death, I also began my teaching career at Grace Lutheran College. I loved teaching. I had an amazing community of colleagues among whom I made two very dear lifelong friends and a student or two. I also loved the kids. It was a vacation in which I could be me and get paid for it. But life was often hard. David was in hospital a lot. I was on my own a lot. Often I felt deeply wounded as I experienced what I saw as rejection by my family. I was needy, honest to a fault, literally. And I did not see the freight train coming towards me. I'd noticed in David what I thought was depression, but all of a sudden I was faced with the reality that the person who had promised to love me and I had promised to love and was working to support was leaving me to be with someone else. I was 26. I wrote poetry some years ago to describe how I felt to go through this abandonment desperately trying to work things out and then wading through a process which ended in acceptance and divorce. I describe myself as the grotesque walking dead. I felt like a complete failure, unloved and unlovable. Going to church felt humiliating. Going to work felt impossible. You loved me. Where did I belong? And yet this is the period when Henry became my dear friend. And my journey to greater wholeness began in earnest. Henry, alongside my community at Grace College, helped me know grace amidst suffering. Then at the end of 2003, I suddenly knew I was going to Regent College. I applied and found myself heading to Vancouver. I spent two years studying, living in a community house, volunteering and traveling. I felt at home there amongst people from all over the world who wanted to think about and talk about who God is, how we could live our short, precious lives and what following Jesus looked like. Confronted by issues such as my own divorce and discovering that my dear friend was gay, 
I researched and wrote papers and poetry about poetry about how the church sees not just those issues, but the people like me and my friend who did not fit the image preached. Debate and dialogue was integral at Regent. Diverse denominations and perspectives were welcomed. I devoured the classics of Christian spirituality and I kept reading Henry. Amongst all this wonder and joy, a sense of belonging. Amongst all this wonder and joy, and a sense of belonging, there was still pain. I fell in love again, but it was not to be. I didn't have a plan. I wasn't sure what was coming next. I felt lost, lonely, and left out. I returned to Australia, but no longer knew where home was for me. I took a contract in Melbourne, but things were unravelling. I found myself crying so much I couldn't do my job. I wondered what was wrong with me and why I couldn't pull myself together. I was a spring that had been pulled too, pulled too far and too hard. There was no spring left. I finally found myself at the doctor with a diagnosis of depression. The pain of the preceding years had overcome me. But still Henry journeyed with me. He himself was a wounded healer. I also experienced Christ's love from my mother who helped me hobble to the end of my teaching contract. In June 2008, 20 years after I first met 17-year-old Simon, I became re reacquainted with a beautiful, kind man who became my lovely husband. Since those heady years of joy and surprise at new life and love, I sit frequently with the wonder of this last decade, decade, decade or so of my life. There has continued to be wrestle and suffering. My dear Ali and Dean lost their precious suffering Hugh at five years old. And then with a two-year-old and a five-year-old, I found myself with a diagnosis of cancerous ovarian cyst in mid-2017 that began almost a year-long journey of surgery and treatment. But we made it through. And now today, I face my greatest challenge. As our two beautiful children remind me every day of every week, of the reality of my woundedness and the limitations of my love. And so now, just as always, I need Henry's reminders about how to live the Christian life, how to, be, how to continue to be with God or to be present to God's presence in my life and in the world. Amidst this life story characterised for me by suffering, beauty and grace, I have asked over and over again, who is God, where is God and who am I? Do I belong? Renee Brown says everyone is worthy of love and belonging. Is the need for love and belonging the journey of every person? For me it is. And Henry has helped me to keep finding my place, my place with the God we see in Jesus. So what has Henry said to me about who God is and what God is like? Henry said, God loved us first. And it is in this wide open, welcoming cloak of God's first love that we live and move and have our being. Henry gets grace and he experienced God's expansive love as the source in which we can participate. In turn, Henry preached this gospel, which I need to hear every day. I think Henry would agree with Natalia Mirandiuk. We are creatures of love. 
God loves us and gives us the unique difference of our existence. While God's love is universally given, it is also uniquely given to each one of us in our own particularity. God creates you and God creates me in a different way. God's love has a directionality, a singularity and a specificity that is, in a certain sense of the word, not uniform because it creates different sorts of people. So when we love each other the right way, we participate in God's flows of love that already have a directionality into the human difference. Henry believed in a theology of the cross. God in the little, the lost and the lonely. Divine power revealed in the weakness of the cross. God is right there amidst my pain, my struggle, my suffering. He said, it is hard to believe that God would reveal his divine presence in the self-emptying, humble way of the man of Nazareth. So much in me seeks power, influence, success and popularity. But the way of Jesus is the way of hiddenness, powerlessness and littleness. I am grateful for the new place that has been opened in me through all the inner pain. So says Henry, so say I. Henry said, God is father and mother. Using the knowledge and experience we have in this world, Henry uses these categories to speak tenderly about a God beyond our categories. This God is a God for all people. This God is a God for me. Henry also spoke to me in answer to my question, what is the nature of the spiritual life? How does God come to me? Jesus' life, death and resurrection show us the heart of God. Henry mines the depths of Jesus' life and teachings to paint a wide and glorious picture of a God we can begin to grasp and love. This central focus on Jesus has shifted the emphasis for me. It is apparent in all Henry's writings but one book I love is a posthumously published collection of writings called Jesus, a Gospel. This emphasis sits hand in hand with another of Henry's gifts to me. The spiritual life of a Christian is one in which images and the imagination can be powerful ways that transform our perspectives and lived realities. The historic Protestant emphasis on scripture came as a correction to a church which had somehow lost the gravity of the scriptures or a sense of that. And I wonder sometimes if this part of the church's story has meant that the Western Protestant church lost touch with the richness of imagery alongside scripture. After all, art too is an interpretation of scripture, which can be a rich source of insight and challenge also. Henry's writings opened up a whole new world for me one which has been an increasingly important part of my journey with God. Henry introduced me to the world of religious art. I look back now and see that he opened up for me the notion of icons, not just icons as understood by the Orthodox tradition, but a more sacramental view of reality, particularly as it relates to the images and the ways in which they can be transformational. Both Rembrandt's The Return of the Prodigal and Rublev's Icon of the Trinity are embedded deep within me. The expansiveness of God's loving kindness, inclusion, grace and faithfulness seen in these two paintings, which I first came to know and love through the work of Henry Nouwen, indelibly shaped my imagination. This picture of God is what I have desperately needed to heal my woundedness. In fact, I need this every day. My understanding and love of prayer grew too through the way in which Henry sat before these images and the gospel stories from which they came. I didn't know it at the time, but I was learning the Ignatian way of praying with scripture, putting myself in these stories and images with Jesus. For Henry, the faith life is characterised by spacious hospitality. There is always space at God's table 
And the fundamental call on my life is to make room for others, the other, for God and for myself. Henry preached this and lived this out both in the way he drew on the richness of Christian voices beyond his own tradition and the way he made room for people to come to the table wounded, broken, angry, resentful, and the list could go on. Because he showed himself to carry all these burdens. He said, can the elder son in me be healed? Referring to the elder son of the prodigal. I have tried so hard in the past to heal myself from my complaints and failed and failed until I came to the edge of complete emotional and even physical exhaustion. I can only be healed from above, says Henry, from where God reaches down to me. I agree with Henry that authentic spirituality wrestles with the now and the not yet, with the gap between cognitive assent and actual reality, between belief and trust. Spiritual guides live with the tensions. Henry taught me that a faith life is paradoxical. It is both end. We are saints and sinners. Finally, Henry also spoke to my question, who am I? Henry reassured me that my fundamental identity is as God's beloved child. I am loved and accepted. I am chosen. It can be a struggle to believe this amidst life's experiences of abandonment, self-rejection, hurt and pain. Henry said and lived over and over again that this fundamental identity has nothing to do with the identity as society perceives it based on producing and consuming or in my case as an Enneagram 1, the high standards I set for myself. A Yale and Harvard professor before a full-time community member of LASH, Henry had lived with the ultimate producers and consumers of our society, as well as with those who because of mental and physical disabilities could only simply be. Convincing Henry that he too was loved simply because he was. From his book, Life of the Beloved, I quote, Becoming the beloved means letting the truth of our belovedness become enfleshed in everything we think, say, or do. It entails a long and painful process of appropriation. I concur. Henry also emphasised that as human beings, we are individuals who are also communal. In solitude, we face our demons, and even more powerfully, we can see and be seen by God. In community, we can and need to hear our blessings. So much of what we experience in our lives is about measuring up to some standard or another. But this is about our original goodness, thanks Pelagius, that God made us and said it was very good. Following the pattern of Jesus, Henry's words and practice of solitude have been an invitation to me to make space to retreat, space to retreat, and it is a pattern of life I know I need. Henry said, the spiritual life as the active presence of God's spirit in the midst of a worry-filled existence, this life becomes a possibility when, by the disciplines of community and solitude, we slowly create some free inner space in our filled lives and so allow God's spirit to become manifest in us. In solitude, we unmask the illusions of our own possessiveness and discover the centre of our own self, that, that we are not what we can conquer, but what is given to us. And community, too, is critical to seeing God. Henry said, a mosaic consists of thousands of little stones. Some are blue, some are green, some are yellow, some are gold. When we bring our faces close to the mosaic, we can admire the beauty of each stone. But as we step back from it, we can see that all these little stones reveal to us a beautiful picture, telling a story none of these stones can tell by itself. 
This is what our life in community is about. Each of us is a little stone, but together we reveal the face of God to the world. Nobody can say, I make God visible, but others who see us together can say, they make God visible. Community is where humility and glory touch. Henry spoke too about human sameness and the reality that only with our recognition that I too could hate and destroy do we have the capacity to love and care for each other. Henry said, when we dare to care, then we discover that nothing human is foreign to us, but that all the hatred and love, cruelty and compassion, fear and joy can be found in our own hearts. When we dare to care, we have to confess that when others kill, I could have killed too. Or in my case, that I too could have been unfaithful. This was transformational for me. Henry invited us in the story of the prodigal to see ourselves as both the younger son who had run away, the older son who had stayed but was nonetheless not present, and also the loving father. He said, I hope and pray that you too will discover within yourselves not only the lost children of God, but also the compassionate mother and father that is God. Henry's life and writings have been a key for me to finding God's shalom, a flourishing life. I finish here with three quotes, which I know to be an everyday affair with the God who knows and loves me and you too. Henry invites us to dwell in God's house of love. He said, through the spiritual life, we gradually move from the house of fear to the house of love. We serve the world by being spiritually well. The first question is not how much do we do or how many people do we help, but are we interiorly at peace? And finally, Jesus changes our history from a random series of sad incidents and accidents into a constant opportunity for a change of heart. I am enormously blessed. My life of suffering, beauty and grace has led me ever deeper into the arms of God's love. It is the water, the soil, and the sunshine of our lives. Thank you. <laughs> One um, final comment. Um, I posted on Instagram, um, which is Steph, S-T-E-P-H-M-A-H-M-C, if you're interested. The two, two pictures, the two images I spoke about and a couple of other quotes from Henry also. Steph, uh, stay around. Um, I'm Paul Mercer and uh, I was a very bad companion to Stephanie. I disappeared at the start of this event. Uh, we've got more people here today than we imagined and I had to go looking for some seats. So I, I, I was waiting for the hotel staff to help me, so I apologise. But you've given us a fantastic gift today. Have we all sensed that? And uh, the, the title you chose about the gentle companioning of Henry in your journey, I think, really resonates. And uh, so we usually have a bit of a chance to have a, a conversation now. Are you up for that? Fine. Okay. So... There are two ways we can do this, and I'll perhaps get your responses. Maybe you'd just like to be quiet for five minutes. What we often do is get groups to have a little conversation and write a question. Um, maybe you'd like to do that, or else people could just start asking questions and we'll see how we go. Um, it's a bigger crowd, so maybe having your own conversations first might be best. To, is all in favour of that? idea <laughs> or sounds good sounds good so let's just don't get too close but have a bit of a gathering conversation about how this 
gift that Stephanie has given us, the Holy Spirit has given us, is impacting you today. And then generate some questions. We have been handing around the books that showed those photos on the front, so you may have even looked at those photos, and uh, there are more books there. But just, just let this sink with us for a few seconds, and uh, let Stephanie gather her breath. And, uh, and we'll gather in a few minutes to talk about what your questions might be. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very, very much. Well, I think, I don't think we can stop. We'll just hold it for a sec. Um, it's delayed a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. We can cut this out, Mark. Good luck. There's, there's about a hundred dollars in the bucket for staff. Shall I give it to her? Yeah, shall I give it to you then? <laughs> really? I wonder if there's anybody who hasn't got a ticket. One more. You haven't got one? This is the book. You organize with somebody in the room? Some blue, some green. Seems to be any live chat questions. So, uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll too long.
So if I could uh, ask you to sort of gather your thoughts and if there's a, any questions. I haven't seen any written questions, but uh, if there is one, thank you very much. If, you, if, you, if you're still thinking of a question, don't, don't, don't hold back. But um, So uh, I'd, I'd, I'd invite you to keep thinking and writing. And uh, Stephanie, here's a really uh, in, in your face question. Okay. So, uh, for me, the So, this question. Uh, this question, if I can just draw our attention, um, ask, the, ask this. You mentioned being divorced and Henry being gay and how neither were acceptable in the church. Can you say some more of how you have made the, this journey of coming to be acceptable? Um. Yeah, that's, that's a big question um, and I'm the kind of person who likes to go think about things before I answer them, but anyway, I'll give it a go. Um, I, I actually think one of the things, being me, that I do is I, I absolutely have to be honest somewhere, somehow. And it's an absolute gift when someone gives you the opportunity to do that. So when I was at Regent, um, I undertook a course called the Christian Imagination and we had a creative project um, opportunity um, and I wrote a series of project uh, poems about my divorce and I was very honest. Um, I was very honest about how terrible it was to be me and to be going through that in the church. Um, and... But I also, you know, that message um, of Henry it, that was just absolutely transformational for me, that, that thing that says, if you kill, I could kill too. It was absolutely transformational for me because um, I was always then trying to put myself in the other person's shoes. And... Um, So part of the, one of the poems that I wrote was a responsorial psalm um, and it was an opportunity, an invitation for people to confess with me about the way we treat one another. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is two things there. One was my willingness to be absolutely vulnerable about how terrible I felt um, and my experience but also to realise that I can be just as judgmental about other things and other people. Um, the second part of it for me, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a seeker, I'm a searcher. So um, writing the paper, the theological paper, when I was at Regent about divorce was me going, I have to wrestle with this myself. I have to get in there and I have to read what people are saying. I have to understand why people are in this camp and that camp and the other camp and somehow pray that God will find me a place of peace there. So that's me. So some other questions. Stephanie, um, bringing your own narrative alongside Henry wonderful way, mechanistic way is a wonderful way of really engaging with people. Yeah. So that, that was great. I was just wondering um, how important in that relationship has been Henry's um, willingness to reveal his own willingness. Oh that that's that's Can utterly you repeat the question. Yeah, I can repeat it. So how important has Henry's willingness to re 
reveal his own woundedness, how important has that been to the journey? I think that's really the crux of it, to be honest, um, because Henry is talking about um, sit, like sitting, you know, in God's gaze and experiencing God's love on the one hand, and then on the other hand he's saying, I don't belong, who am I, you know, I feel terrible. He holds those two things together. And for me that is what it is. That's the human condition, um, that we, we hold these things together and that um, we, we anticipate that God is growing his love in us, but we, we carry those wounds with us forever. Firstly, um, Stephanie, thank you for sharing your journey with us, for making yourself so vulnerable and, and owning things that are open with us. Um, you've know, allowed us to kind of journey through the sun and see your grief um, over the years, but also absolutely, I know, see such a beauty in story. And so, but, you know, it's a, a hard thing to accept. Thank you. My question is, for those that of us that are fairly new to Henry now, what do you suggest is a great book to start with? So the question is, what's a good book to start uh, a journey with Henry now and as a companion? I suggest that I actually unwind the microphone here, that if you want to ask a question, you actually come up to the microphone and ask it. Is that all right? And... Um, Got another one? Okay, so we'll, we'll get, we'll, we're uh, doing this uh, as we go. We'll work it out. We've got used to people writing the questions, but that's that's all right. But Dave's going to have a second microphone. So if you next person for the question, come up here. Thanks, Dave. I would actually really recommend this little collection. It's it's on a, It's like. Um, it's sort of like a collection of about four devotions. It's very, very short, but it really captures some of the heart of what Henry is about. And there's some really um, pithy, pithy stuff in there. I absolutely love this book. Um, yeah. Um, it's called Out of Solitude. Out of Solitude, Three Meditations on the Christian Life. Um, Adele, you mentioned the return of the prodigal. This is a this is an absolute classic. Like, if you haven't read that, you should read it. Um, it is just so so rich. Um, Henry sat with. I I've wanted to go to St Petersburg ever since I read this book. I don't know if I'll ever get there, but maybe. I think Simon does have some Russian heritage, so you never know. <laughs> um, but. Yeah, um, he sat um, in the Hermitage and with that painting for hours and hours. He researched for hours and hours um, Rembrandt's story um, of writing the, the pro, uh, sorry, drawing or painting the, um, the Return of the Prodigal. Um, he also did a huge amount of research into why the painting is as it is. So if you have a look at it, um, the elder brother is in the photo with the younger son. And we know from the story that that's actually not the case. So why did he do that? There's, it's just it's just so, so rich, so rich. His, his um, discussion of um, who God is inviting us to be, who God is, um, and just, you know, for me, I think a huge part of it, um, I don't think I can emphasise enough that what Henry's brought to me is a way of being spiritual, um, a way of praying. And that's what comes through strongly, certainly in this book. Um, I think if you want to read more about the idea of um, who we are uh, um, as people, as, in, as human beings, um, Life of the Beloved um, is also a classic. It was written to his friend in New York who was Jewish and not Christian, and Henry wanted to tell him about what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. So he tried to write for a secular audience. I don't think he did a very good job of that, but he certainly did a good job of for me. Um, and I spoke about this one. Uh, look, Henry has got, um, I don't know, 50 more publications and a lot published posthumously. Um, 
But I also love this because it's a collection, short devotions and lots of Rembrandt paintings. Um, that's not a good, good example, but um, yeah. And one other book that I don't actually have with me that I also love is Adam. Um, and that's the story of um, the man with whom Henry left, lived um, in the Lash community and who Henry um, cared for. And that too is also a transformational book. So there's a question here first, sorry. Okay, I was, I was, I'm going to start with a comment. Um, I really loved hearing your personal story because it made the whole message feel so much more embodied. So thank you for that. It was amazing. Thank you. Um, um, the, the bit that like kind of nearly moved me to tears was um, when you mentioned like Jesus has a place at the table for everyone, even the most outcasted person, like that just you know, really gets me. Um, I was wondering, you kind of said after that, I think that the your life, like a, something about the other and being in solidarity with people who are the other. I was just kind of wondering, like, if you could tell us more literally, like, where that manifests in your everyday life. Um, I live a pretty suburban life these days, actually. Um, I live in Redcliffe, um, in a house with two children, you know, <laughs> pretty pretty suburban. Um, our neighbours are pretty white and pretty middle class. Um, however, I am absolutely privileged to work in education. Um, so one of the things that happened for me when I was in Vancouver was that um, I volunteered um, with the Mennonite Central Committee um, and they had a, um, a ministry serving um, people who were homeless or experiencing homelessness um, and also people who um, struggled with drug, drug addiction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that they did, um, and particularly Laura, who, with whom I worked, was um, she had a program where she brought students to the city over the summer. Um, they thought they were coming to help, um, but they were actually coming to learn. Little did they know. Um, and that was my first experience of what we call in Lutheran education circles service learning. Um, and it's really about, um, well, I say it's about learning to be a human being, um, but it's about integrating learning, everyday learning, with an attitude of service and inclusion of the other. Um, and that, 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 um, Practice of service learning is what we call one of our central practices in Lutheran education. Um, and I'm lucky enough to work with some wonderful people like over there on my right and also Meg um, sitting here in the middle who are all hugely passionate about service learning. Um, and we have a lot of things going on in our schools where we're trying to integrate the two. So it's not just about going out and doing something. It's about engaging with building partnership and learning from one another. So that's my current involvement. Yeah. Yeah. If anyone else likes a question, come over towards the mic so you're ready to go, okay? As a middle class man, my introduction to Henry Nguyen was the book Adam, in which I discovered that he could create a love experience for somebody who could not communicate, someone who was deeply intellectually impaired. And I thought, how do you create an existential love? So my question to you, Stephanie, is about creating existential love. You're a teacher of teachers. And it's one thing to teach that God loves you and for people to learn that God loves you intellectually, but there were hundreds of lepers in Israel and only one was healed. So in a time when God isn't speaking very loudly, how can you communicate or how can you enable somebody to feel the love of God with reference to Henry? Well, Mac, as you know, 
you are much more, um, what's the word? <laughs> Having the, the, the right experience and the words to answer your own question. <laughs> However, I'll give it a go. Um, I actually want to go back to service learning and one of the concepts that we try to teach our young people is about presence and Henry talks a lot about that, about presence. And you know what? I experienced it in my own life. I'm, I'm an introvert and I'm exhausted when I come home from work and I'm not really interested in talking, but I really want to just sit next to my husband <laughs> and be with. There was actually a beautiful podcast I listened to during um, earlier in the year. Um, there's a podcast out of Yale with uh, Miroslav Volf, who's a theologian I love. Um, and it was a discussion with John Hare, um, an ethicist, um, about what is, it, what is it to be a human being. And they went on to talk about being with and that our God is Emmanuel, God with us. And that part of the huge suffering of COVID is actually that we can't be with, physically with one another. Um, and so I don't have anything wise to say, but that's that for me is, is love. I also think um, I, I'm always going on about to these girls and that they roll their eyes, but I'm always going on about how listening is love and listening is service. And that's one of the, that's a, um, that's a quote from um, M. Scott Peck um, from The Road Less Travelled. But um, once again, I've, I've never worked with people who have mental handicaps but I think there is a way to listen to each other without using words too, and I hope I can learn that. Um, Steph, you, you talked about coming from a, an austere sort of a Christianity where the arts and the iconography and things were not so obvious. That was very much my background. And coming to that much later in life, that idea of the arts and beauty and such like. I, um, you talked about that tradition of putting yourself in the painting. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yep. Um, so Henry doesn't, uh, I actually, when I was preparing for today, I, I looked up whether people had written about Henry using the Ignatian practice of praying with scripture and I couldn't find anything, probably something written somewhere, but um, that's really what he does. So, for example, if we take the story um, of, let's call it the loving father, um, he puts himself in the position of each of the characters and, and basically sits there in that character and observes and asks God what God wants to say um, and just, yeah, I guess tries to use all of the senses to imagine themselves in the scene and what it might have been like. Um, what's interesting to me is I teach um, a course for teachers who teach Christian studies in our schools um, and many of them have very little knowledge of faith or Bible, anything like that. They absolutely love this idea that you can put yourself in the story and listen to God in the story. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question, but... You can just look up Ignatian praying with scripture and you'll find stuff. Steph, it's uh, probably a question rattling around in my brain, but I feel this is probably a very good moment to stop and to really thank you very much. I, I won't uh, sort of indulge myself as it were. We want to thank you very, very, very much. So here's a little thank you note from us, Theology on Tap. I want to thank Dave for bringing the PA and Matthew, who isn't well today, but can make sure that we're online. So Jeff and uh, coming in late, but uh, you can actually still watch what Steph has said. So we go live. At, we haven't got the music back into this situation yet because we're still exploring what the COVID world means. So we're starting a little bit earlier for those who 
we perhaps were a bit uncertain about this. Um, but uh, we, 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 we're saving uh, the talks and they, uh, they're on YouTube and at some point they'll be taken down. But uh, there's a YouTube channel now for Theology on Tap. And you can go back and look at your own talk <laughs> and, uh, and, and learn from yourself. <laughs> I think that would be unwise. <laughs> um, so, look, uh, thank you everybody for coming. The hotel is open for meals, uh, and you can stay and, uh, in a, an appropriate uh, manner, have a meal here at the hotel now. Um, our next event actually will in involve Steph. So Steph, Steph's, Steph's doubling up. She's really going for it now. She's joined in Theology on Tap, and she's going to come on twice. But we've, we've imagined the possibility of having a forum to think through the implications of COVID for the church going forward. So we, we, we entitled our next month's activity, Singing the Lord's Song in a Strange Land, Invitations for a Post-COVID Church. And uh, we've got a number of participants who are going to share um, briefly some, some sort of start-up thoughts about that. And uh, this will be an event where you'll be invited through uh, uh, Eventbrite to join a Zoom link. And uh, you can then, uh, on the live chat part of the Zoom, ask questions. And so once the people who are on the panel, and there's uh, Scott Guide, who's um, involved in the Tawong United Church here in Brisbane, there's Stephanie. There's Dave Benson, who's been a presenter here at Theology on Tap and is now in London. So he's joining us live from London. <laughs> uh, we've got Johannes Lutz, who's been part of uh, our program before and who is at Heritage College here in Brisbane. We've got Amelia Cope Butler, who's um, very active in uh, exploring church in an interfaith context in Sydney. And so she's joining us from Sydney. And we've got Maddie Lee, who's a student at Madian College, who's, who's sort of looking at this as a younger person as well. So um, I think those people will, will help us start a conversation, which we're inviting everybody to participate in. David Bush, who, uh, again, has been to a, one or two of our events and who has previously worked for the ABC, is going to moderate the forum. And uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to get the technology working pretty well for us on that, on that e evening. It'll be Sunday the 1st of November. So we'll start that event around about 4.15. So everybody, 4, 4.15, once we've gathered, everybody's got online and we've settled. We're hoping here to see if we can make the Zoom stream, stream through the camera so you can see it on the wall. So you could still come here and then you could waltz up to the computer, it'll be, have a Zoom link, and you can ask, still ask your question. So there might be 40 of us here, but we will all just perhaps use, use that computer, or you could bring your phone if you've got a Zoom link and ask questions directly wherever you are. So we're asking everybody to take that leap into the technological future and participate in a, a, a live Zoom event that gathers Christians around Brisbane to think through a post-COVID future. Does, does that seem like a good, good way to go in 2020? It's been a very strange year, very unusual year, and uh, we've done, you know, it's been a blessing to actually keep going, and uh, thanks for those of us who've supported us at this time. Can you tell people how to get Zoom? Okay, so at present, we actually haven't got a Zoom link registered, and so we were discussing whether we needed a Zoom platform that took 100 or 400, and we haven't been able to find a 400 platform, so we're going to have to stick with the 100. So come here, come here, and you can still use one link. Um, but uh, the, the, there's a thing called a, a Event Bright, I think yeah. it's called, and so there'll be an Event Bright invitation that goes with with uh, with uh, advertising. Go to our Facebook page, um, register through Event Bright. We sort of want to have a little bit of a demographic. What tradition are you from? Lutheran, Pentecostal, Baptist? Just to have a bit of a feel for the group that we've got on the day. 
and um, um, and uh, then you'll have the link. And I don't know whether anyone's been to a Zoom meeting where there's been Zoom bombed, but that's not a very pleasant experience. But we'll have a a, a moderator who'll be able to knock out anyone who comes in to try and just make a mess of it all. And um, I've had an experience with someone was just swearing, a woman swearing terribly and writing swat stickers and terrible words on the screen and so forth. So I'm happy to avoid that, but we're hoping that it'll be a good thing. So Steph, you've got here, you've got a job to do. You've got to actually draw, okay. draw a, a number out I'll of that. I'll do hand. the job if you let me say one more thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just going to say, this is the teacher coming out of me. So there was some research done recently um, out of um, Europe about how when we draw um, out of um, Europe about how when we draw this is the teacher coming out of me. So there was some research done recently um, out of um, Europe about how when we draw rather than write words that it's it's five more five times more likely to stay in our memories. So if you buy one of these Charles books, which looks pretty awesome, can I? recommend to you that you use those pages to draw your thoughts. Wow. Here we are. Drum Even roll. if you're not good at drawing, which I'm not. Drum roll. <laughs> okay. Da -na 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 -na. Oh, you can write too. I know. Yeah, I, I didn't really understand it when you first wrote it, but there is, there is a, a word. Sorry. There are, there are some sayings and some words so you can sit down and think about it. And, you can have a and then you can do some drawing, but you can also journal. So to sit with it. So that's why it's called, because people haven't got time these days often to read a big book. So they're reading a quick one, but just to have their own journaling or just, just with a cup of coffee. So it's very easy. Uh, I think they're 15 minutes. Yeah. There's some available. Today. Sounds cool. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Okay, have you got green E58? Green E58. And just finally, um, uh, Charles is um, no stranger to us, Charles Ringmar, is no stranger to the writings of Henry Muir, and he has written two books, and they are absolutely delightful, and uh, they're, they're for sale over there if anybody's interested. Uh, grab them while you can, they're cheap. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.